Hello. Hello. How many of you have heard about software craftsmanship before? Hooray. Wow, that's more than I expected. That's good. So you see when I'm lying then. Uh, before I go to software craftsmanship, I would like to talk a little bit about Agile. How many of you have seen this? Yeah, okay. So, back in February 2001, 17 people uh, got together in a ski resort in Utah to discuss better ways of developing software. Uh, they were representatives of uh, Scrum, Extreme Programming, uh, Crystal, feature-driven development, DSDM, quite a few methodologies. So these guys got together to find alternatives to waterfall and uh, document-based methodologies. And they came up with this very well-written uh, manifesto. I really like the Agile Manifesto. And, and that was when the Agile uh, Alliance was formed and some conferences all over the world started where they were uh, explaining to the rest of the world what they were trying to do together. So then loads of companies looked at this and said, wow, that's great. Like, I want a little bit of that. And then the whole agile transformation era began. And I was working for a consultancy company back, back then. Uh, and I've done a lot of this, going to companies and helping them to become agile. And then we, basically what happened as you, I believe that, how many of you work with some sort of an agile environment? Right, yeah, see, so these guys like basically changed the way that we do software. And as you've seen, probably you went through these agile transformations yourselves and you saw that like now loads of companies uh, start having like stand ups and burn down charts and agile coaches running everywhere and iterations and use case became user stories, uh, whiteboard everywhere that is awesome uh, and post-its of course. Because post-its is the real deal. Like if you have post-its in the wall, you are really agile, right? That's how you measure agility. Number of colorful post-its. Needs to be colorful. So, and then we spent like 10 years uh, talking about bureaucracy and reducing waste and people, interactions, communication. Real problems that had to be addressed. And agile does a good job at it. At least some met methodologies like Scrum and many other ones. Uh, the problem is that Agile took a detour at some point, and process became more important than the technical disciplines. So the technical disciplines of Agile, they were completely forgotten uh, over the years. And then, after many companies went through this Agile transformation, uh, <laughs> that happened, the Agile hangover. All of a sudden, all these companies woke up in the morning with a massive headache after all the post-its in the wall and said, Jesus, we are as shit as we were before. The only difference now is that you see the pile of shit growing every two weeks, right? <laughs> and then that's how we know how that we are doing well. Like, oh, this week we did good. We just add a little bit of shit to the pile. Oh, this week, <laughs> not good at all. The pile is much bigger now. And, but the old problems were still there. Uh, how many of you work with legacy code? Or s many of these legacy codes, they were written during Agile projects. So the old problems, they were still there. Long cycles to release, loads of bugs, dedicated QA teams. How many of you have de dedicated QA team or testers? Some of you, yeah. So technical debt and all this sort of stuff, it was all there. But then I say, well, it's kind of unfair. Like you come here and say that we are all doing shit and no one wakes up in the morning and say like, today I'm gonna screw up. Today I'm gonna write the worst code possible. Today I'm gonna really, really make my clients pissed off and all my colleagues. No one does. Some people do that, but normal people don't do that, right? Just very few people do that kind of crazy stuff. But the problem is that when we are uh, under pressure, we cut corners. We fall back to what we were doing before. We forget some of our practices. And being a developer myself, uh, I came to realize that we have the wrong notion of time. When we are planning, we normally say, okay, I'm gonna take two hours to do this um, 
service and four hours to do this UI and half an hour to add a table in a database and uh, all this sort of stuff. But very rarely we take our time to say, how can we make our system better? How can I, I, we have this new feature coming in. So how can I, first of all, before adding more pile to the sheet, let's refactor our system, make it ready so we can just nicely slide the new feature in. Very rarely we do that. And also, like when I joined this big investment bank, uh, in my first week, there was this guy that was, he was very busy, very busy. And I said, oh, can I pair with you? And then he said, yeah, sure. Uh, I'm a bit busy, but if you want to stay there, just look. And then he was there putting logs on the code, loads of logs. And I was just looking. And then he was uh, packaging the software, copying that to another machine, kind of a production-like environment, deploying it, running the application, pushing messages to the queue. We were doing enterprise applications, so we didn't have UI, so we are just pushing XML messages to a queue, and then looking at the logs. Damn, it's not there. And then he would go back, put more logs, and then package, copy it across, deploy, start, push message, look at the logs, look at the logs. Ha ha! And then he would go back, and I said, well, hold on a second, like, why don't we just try to run it locally? Oh, no, this application doesn't run locally. It has too many dependencies. Well, let's take the time to make it run locally. It would be much easier to do. No, we don't have time for that. Don't have time for that. So, well, okay, let's write a unit test, because then you don't need all the logs. You just figure out what the class is doing. We don't have time to test here. And then he found the place. So, well, there is this block, because, like, methods are this big, right? So... So, well, I don't need the whole thing. Maybe I can take this bit, copy it across, put a global variable, and if state one jump, the whole thing that I don't understand anyway, uh, and then execute that. Package, copy it across, deploy, load the loss. I think that is right now. Ready to ship. That was three hours. Because he doesn't have time to do the right thing. And apparently QA, is there any testers in the audience? No testers? One? This guy here, too, they have all the time in the world to deal with the crap that we produce. We do all this crap and throw, there we go, man, find the bugs. And then they find loads of bugs for us. They do a great job, right? So they are the only people that have time, because we developers don't. Um, but what is to be agile, anyway? Um, so there is a lot of misunderstanding about what agility means. First, we see a lot of people saying, oh, we do agile. In English, this doesn't make any sense, saying that. Well, in any language, if you translate. Uh, you cannot do agile. Agile is not a thing that you do. You are either agile or you are not agile. You cannot do agile. It does, it's, agile is an umbrella full of methodology. You cannot do agile. So agile is all about quick and short feedback loops. That's what about. Agile. That if you take all the, the Agile methodologies, in one way or another, what they are trying to achieve at different levels is to give you a quick and short feedback loop. And when you have this quick and short feedback loop, you get uh, information. And when you get this information every two weeks, every, every test, every second, then when you get this information, the act of reacting or doing something with this new information is what gives you, may give you or not agility is reacting to the information and adapting constantly. So that's what Agile is. That, so the quicker and the shorter the feedback loop is, the more chances you have to be Agile. Right? So um, another thing that I like to say is that normally uh, Agile doesn't solve problems. Agile exposes problems. It shows to you what is wrong. And then it's up to you to do something about it. And that's Agility. So. In the craftsmanship world, we have a little bit of a problem with the working software. It was good while we knew what we were talking about in the past, but that, like all this legacy code, like all of you said, oh, we work in agile projects. All of you said, yeah, we have loads of legacy code. We struggle with our software. So all this mess that we deal with on a daily basis, this is working software. Software that we are, that is fragile, tight coupled, that is difficult to understand, that takes forever to deploy into production, that uh, takes like two months to test. That's all working software. And managers can say whatever they want in terms of 
methodologies and process. They can talk about Scrum and Kanban and Lean and all the process that they want. But in a software project, the most important deliverable is the software itself. If the software, software sucks, it doesn't matter which process you use. As simple as that. And another thing that the business doesn't realize, because many, uh, the, the ones that are less mature in terms of technology or, or software development, they don't value the developers too much. But what they don't realize is that they are a hostage of their own software. Because they can have the best ideas in the world. They want, oh, we have this idea, we're going to change the world, we're going to be multi-billionaires. But they will go just as fast as we can change the software. We dictate the speed of the business. So we hold the business hostage of their own software. They don't realize that. But if we are holding them hostage, if they are not achieving, that's our fault. We are not doing a good job to enable the business to be agile. Because it doesn't matter if we try to do a, a giant our little project. Well, but if you are not enabling the business to be agile, it's all pointless. Once I joined this big telecom company, and you know, uh, in large organizations, they have this funny thing that every six months or quarter or whatever, the big boss comes from the sky, and then he says, no, we, let's group here. And then he goes there, and then uh, talking about the profits and the great ideas, and you know, that kind of stuff, that you're bored to death, and <laughs> everyone sleeps on that, that part. And so they, they talk about all these things, right? The, the plans for the future to change the world. And then in, in these large telecom company, they had a, a, a QA team that was shared across many projects. And then the, the big boss was saying, so now uh, I was reading the report, of course. Uh, I was reading the reports. Our QA team uh, found 1,000 bugs in six months. That's awesome. Let's clap. And then everyone was, hey, QA. So what sort of madness is this? I would have fired half of the company. QA should find nothing, zero. If this guy needs like, to earn money for each bug he found, he will starve to death. He will die. QA should find nothing, zero, nada. Every bug that is found by QA, a developer should be ashamed. It's something that we as developers haven't done. Because they shouldn't, because they pay us to make working software and not to throw over the fence to someone else to say, yeah, see how crap this is, now go and fix. This is not professional. So some of the guys, the originators of uh, the Agile movement, back in November 2008 in Chicago, I think, November or December, so they got together and said, well, this Agile thing, that's not exactly what we had in mind. Like Scrum became mainstream, and Scrum became synonymous of Agile, but that's not exactly, what about the other stuff? So they said, well, we need to do something about it. And then they had a small summit with a group of people uh, in Chicago, and they, they started the craftsmanship movement. So they basically, they evolved the Agile uh, manifesto to something else, and they said, like, it's not just working software, we want well-crafted software, and by well-crafted software, it means uh, software that we are not scared to touch. How many times you were dealing with software that say, oh my God, so I mean, you don't know what's going to happen if you change one, one variable, right? So we don't want that. All these legacy systems, like, if, uh, what we want is like something that is easy to understand, that you can just slide new features in, that represents the business language. So that's what we want in WellCrafted. It's not about beautiful code. It's different. It's code that is easy to deal with. That, we, that the velocity doesn't drop as we move forward. Uh, regardless how old the software is, like, oh, but it's a three-year-old software. So what? Why is it crap anyway? My car is not that crap when it's three years old, right? Um, so steadily adding value. This is not about bug fixing. This is not about adding new features. This is about constantly improving the structure of our systems uh, to keep it clean. Uh, tested. So, as I said, our velocity doesn't drop as we go along. Think about how much you earn per year, like the salaries of developers, the average salary. 
how many developers are in a team, how many managers and then testers and then uh, the whole infrastructure of hardware and telecommunications and salespeople. The amount of people involved in a software project is huge. Mainly if you are coming from large organizations where I was, where we had people all over the world working on the same software, the investment is massive. And then what happens is, when after five years, when they are ready to start uh, benefiting from, well, starting getting a return on their investment, the software is so shit, so shit, it's taking so long to do anything, that they says, oh, let's decommission that. Instead of reducing, they're getting profit. Oh, let's decommission that because it's not good enough. Let's write a new one to replace the existing one that will be as shit as the previous one because they're going to do exactly the same thing with the same techniques, with the same technology even. How crazy is that? Right? So community of professionals, uh, this is what we are doing here today. In the cross ship movement, we believe that it's our moral obligation to train the next generation, to prepare the next generation, to share, to collaborate, because that's the only way that we can get better. We need to start talking to each other, not just in your local user group, but all across countries as well. We, need, we are a very immature industry, but we have a lot of ways to communicate today, and that's what the Software Crossmanship uh, community is about. And my favorite in the Crossmanship Manifesto is the productive partnerships. Uh, we don't really believe in the employer-employee sort of stuff. This is just your contractual model. This is just tells you how you're going to get paid and which benefits you're going to have. But if you want a permanent employee, a contractor, a consultant, or whatever type of agreement, it doesn't matter. The, what it matters is your relationship with the people that pay you to do a job. That's what we care about. That's the partnership. They are your clients, not your boss or your so it doesn't matter if you're an employee, they are your clients. And a lot of people talk about uh, stakeholders. We are stakeholders ourselves. And what is at stake for us developers is our own reputation. Because when you have a, a lot of rubbish code out there that doesn't work and sucks and the testers are having to need to, ha to work like crazy, our reputation is there. Because as soon as we need to go somewhere else, no one will say, oh, hire these guys because they are great. That's not going to happen. Right? Uh, we are there to provide solutions, right? to question, to help our clients to achieve what they want to achieve. Every time that you get a requirement, we should try to argue about it. So like, is this really what you want? What about this and that? We should help them because they don't understand what we can do. So we need to help them. Act as any other professional in our industry, like doctors and lawyers and solicitors, even your hairdresser when you go there and say, like, what about this haircut? We don't do that. We just take orders. We are factory workers. So that needs to change. But I also know for sure that some clients are not prepared for that. I worked uh, for clients where I tried. I tried to go there and get involved more than just my code, but also try to get involved with more things. And I said, no, no, kids, there are smarter people here to deal with that. So in a situation like that, leave the bloody company. Find a better job. Stop being miserable in this place. It's your career we are talking about here. I'm not going to spend my life, that I spend far more time at work than I spend with my own family and kids in, in this situation. Just leave the bloody company. Just incompetent professionals are scared to move jobs. It's as simple as that. Good professionals, they don't struggle to find a job. Period. So, there's no uh, proper definition for craftsmanship. I gave a few. Uh, so if I had to summarize what craftsmanship means in one word, I would say professionalism. That's the word for me that represents what it is. It's not test-driven development. It's not beautiful code. It's none of these nonsense. They are practices, great practices. Craftsmanship is about professionalism. It's different. But there is an overlap between craftsmanship and agile, uh, the current state of agile, the more process-focused state of Agile. Agile helps a lot if you want to answer the first question. Right? So we have the feedback loop, so we get uh, feedback from our clients, from our managers, for people that need the software, and that help us to shape the direction that we are going to go, and then we prioritize different user stories, we change our minds, so that's what, where Agile shines. 
craftsmanship will shine trying to do, answer the second question if we are building the thing right. Can we keep building this thing, enabling the business to change their minds as much as they want? And as they change their mind, we can be as fast as they are to change their minds to change the code as well. That's where craftsmanship will shine. Um, how many of you have seen this? Less hands. Less than half. This is extreme programming. Uh, this has been around for minimum 15 years. Minimum. It was pretty agile. Like the, the creators of the extreme programming was in the agile, they were in the Agile Summit in 2001. Because a lot of people say, yeah, but you come here and you say all these things, but you don't know my company. You don't know my boss. Right? So you don't know our context. You are absolutely right. I don't. But having seen so many companies over almost 20 years of career, your company is less special than you think it is. Like your problems are common, mainly when it comes to writing the code. The business is very different, of course. The context may be different. If you're talking about process, you want to change, like in the agile side, you want to change how people communicate and how teams interact and roles and responsibilities, then context is extremely important. So you can adapt according to your organization. But it's always important if you're talking about software development. So all these things, mainly in the uh, inner circle, they are totally independent of context, totally. So this is just about how you can go to deliver software that works. That's as simple. So you don't need authorization to do test-driven development. You don't need authorization to do refactoring, simple design, continuous integration. You don't need authorization for that. Because the people paying you, they want software that works. That's what they care about. How you've done it, it, it doesn't matter. But I've seen, for example, um, in, in teams where they had the, the, the user story and they broke that down into uh, sto uh, task, tasks. And somehow, yeah, two hours for the service, these amount of hours for these, this, and then a card saying unit test, three hours. How can you finish that one if you don't know if it's working? Why is unit test separate from everything? It's not. And then you give the ability to the product owner or whoever, go say, oh, three hours. Ah, nah, that's all right. It's not that important. They go there and then deprioritize that. So it's not their option how we do things. All right? And also, when we discuss with managers and, and people about, we make the mistake of trying to t talk technical language. They don't understand what is. What they understand is money. Money, value. That's what they understand. And we need to talk at the same level if you want to change things. The problem is that we struggle with that. So if you take s some of these practices, like automated testing, wouldn't it be nice if I could click a button and then in a few minutes, if not a few seconds, I, I know that my entire system works? How long is the normal QA process? Days, if not weeks, in a large organization. I can reduce that to five minutes. That's value. That's feedback loop. So test-driven development. Help us to focus in small problems at a time. Help us to produce code that is totally decoupled, is well-designed, because you cannot write tests and then bang, write a thousand lines to satisfy that. It will be very difficult. So it will help us to focus. It will help us to create regression tests for free, uh, give us constant feedback as we write a test and we already know that it's working. So as soon as you, it goes green, you know that it's working. That's feedback loop. Give us documentation. So that's all value. That's feedback loop. So continuous integration. Regardless if you are working just like a few of you in the same room or if you have people all over the world working on the same code base, as soon as someone commits a piece of code, Continuous integration will run all the tests in a production-like environment and send an email to you in minutes if something went wrong. How long it would take if someone is working in Australia, someone in London, in, in New York, or even next to you? You can have that in minutes. That's value. That's feedback loop. So refactoring, same thing. Keep refactoring our, our system means that we are going to keep a steady velocity because adding new features and maintaining our system will be 
constantly easy because we are always keeping it well organized. And pair programming is the same thing. You have immediate feedback. As soon as you type something, your pair says, what? I don't get that. So what is this? So you get this immediate feedback. Or did you know that there is another class that does that as well? Why don't we use that bit? It's immediate feedback. Even if you compare to code reviews, uh, that's a good thing as well. But the feedback loop in a pair is much shorter. Uh, and that's how we talk to business. That's how we explain to them the value that some certain practices bring. So, but they are just practices. Craftsmanship is an ideology, and we use practices. Uh, I'm happy to throw all of them away. Because I don't discuss them. When I discuss to people, uh, with people, and then I say, like, the question that I normally ask for people that don't want to do these things, and that's totally fine, what I ask is, what do you do instead that is better than that, that gives me a bigger value or a shorter feedback loop? That's my question. Because if you can say that, I will throw all those practices away, because I will do whatever you do, because it must be really good. I'm not smart enough to know better, but I'm sure that as an industry, at some point, we will find, and I will know. But while we don't find, I will use the practices that gives me more value and a shorter feedback loop, because that's what I agility means. Mastering practice is very difficult. Uh, so every time that you try something new, your velocity drops. It's natural. Do you drive? How many of you drive? Majority. Remember the first time that you were driving? How panicked you are. <gasps> right? I remember the first time I had some, some friends in the car and, and I was like, like scared with other cars and my car and stuff. And then I moved to England and had to drive in the opposite side. Oh my God. And then people say, can you uh, switch the radio on? I say, no. Can you open the window? No. Right? Because I was scared with the car. But then think about how you drive today. You don't even remember the car. You just jump in the car and say, yeah, I need to pick up the keys. I need to get my wife. Yeah, I need to go to the supermarket again because you forgot the milk. And you don't even remember the car anymore. It's just an extension of your body. Test-driven development and all those other practices is exactly the same thing. You practice, practice, practice in a safe environment, and then it becomes natural to you. So craftsmanship is a long journey to mastery. And, but that's that saying that the more you know, the more you know that you don't know. And that's very similar. Very rarely we are going to achieve mastery in something. But what is important is the journey. Because like being a software developer is an amazing profession. Amazing. We move the world. Look around of you. Everything, even this bottle of water, there is a software behind this. Right? Food wouldn't get to the supermarkets for everyone if we didn't have the logistic systems and all the, the, the systems. We, as a civilization, we rely on software every single day. And we are the people creating this software. It's just phenomenal. We couldn't ask for a better profession. So we just need to do that properly. Be proud of it. So a craftsman, uh, first of all, has passion for his profession. It's not a nine to five thing. He's passionate, or hers, uh, she is passionate about what she does. She's proud of being a craftsman. So another thing that um, a craftsman owns uh, her own career. I worked with a guy. We joined the same company roughly at the same time. We worked together. This was a consultancy company. We were in the same project. And just checking the time. And, and then we went to different projects. And then almost three, year, three years later, we, we we were back again uh, working together. So I said, wow, that's nice to work with you again. And I was having a great time in that company. I was learning a lot, working with new projects, new technologies. So I asked him, how is it going for you? He said, ah, this company is shit. So I said, so, so how come? No, no, they never bought me a book. Never sent me to a training course. And then all the pros that I get is all this rubbish Java 1.3 thing. So we were a consultancy company. Consultancy company sells people. The better you are, the more you know, the easier it will be for you to go to big, big projects. I asked him, who owns your career? He never understood the question. 
But what I meant by that, because I, I lost interest in the conversation anyway, if you just wait for the company to buy you things, to give you opportunities, the company is controlling your career. And as soon as the company needs for, not because they are evil, maybe there is an economical problem. Maybe they're losing, they're not doing well in the business and they need to, to cut a department. It's not against you, it's, against, it's a situation. What are you gonna do? You are letting someone control your career. A professional controls your career. I buy my own books. I pay for my conference. If the company can give that to me, awesome, it's a bonus. I would love to work there. But if they don't, I don't pay training courses to my plumber, to my solicitor, to my lawyer. Can you imagine going to a dentist and say, and the dentist look at your mouth and say, ah, and they say, oh, can you buy me a book? <laughs> can you imagine that? And imagine that you are so crazy in your head that you say, okay, I'm going to buy you a book, send you a training course. The guy goes there, learn that stuff with the money that you gave, comes back and charge you for the service. How crazy is that? That's what we do. Factory workers. We learn what the company says, we bought new, this new machine, so you need to learn how to operate. I'm going to send a training course on this machine. That's how we behave. So practice. We practice a lot because you cannot always practice at the work environment. We need to deliver software, we need to deliver value, but we need to take our own times, like many other professionals do, to practice, and then when they are in the job, they can do a great job. And they always, like the Boy Scout rule says, that we should always leave the campground cleaner than we found it. We should always try to make things better. Not change the whole world, but at least bit by bit, as we are working with new things, we are making things better. So that's the attitude of a craftsman. We moan a lot, we complain a lot, we say the whole world is against us, and our boss is an asshole, and a company shit, and all this kind of stuff. There was a big fire in a forest. All the animals were panicking and running away because the fire would burn the whole forest. And then the lion, the king of the forest, said, yeah, animals, come and join me. Let's run away from the fire. So the, the lion noticed these hummingbirds flying to the small lake, putting water in his beak and tried to put on the, on the fire. And then the lion said, hummingbird, like, what are you doing? Like, you're nev you'll never be able to extinguish this fire. And the hummingbird said, I know, but I'm doing my part. So when you say, my team doesn't do test-driven development, my team doesn't care, that's no reason for you not to care. It doesn't matter what other people think. What it matters is your career, your profession, how you behave as a professional. That's what it matters. A good developer is not a Java developer. A good developer is not a C-sharp developer. A good developer is not a Ruby developer. A good developer is a developer, period. They use the right tools for the job. They know many tools. They don't have a hammer that starts smashing stuff. They know more than one tool. They open their minds to the world. They choose the best tool for the job. There's no religion. Java is a tool. It's not your religion. It's not your football team. It's a tool. And Scala is a tool. Ruby is a tool. No SQL database are a tool. They are all tools, not a religion. There's no one way to do software. The difference between uh, uh, given time, any mediocre developer can get anything to work, just given time. But the difference between a mediocre developer and a great developer is how they make it work. That's what distinguishes great professionals, is how they make it, not just making it work. We all know that software craftsmanship is not enough to make anything to succeed. But from experience, the lack of craftsmanship in projects may be the main reason for its failure. That's how I see craftsmanship. I cannot answer this question in a very generic way. I cannot answer this question in a way that will satisfy everyone. Um, the only thing that I can do is tell you what it means to me. I started coding when I was 11. Went to university at 17, graduated at 21. During university, I worked two years as a programmer. So when I was 21, in theory, I had exposure to development for 10 years and sort of two years of some commercial experience. And when you have youth, 
and knowledge, normally it leads to arrogance. And I was one of the most arrogant developers ever. I was extremely arrogant. I thought that I was invincible. I could do whatever I wanted. I was awesome. So there was this big international company in Brazil. I was living in Brazil back then. Um, and they announced in the, the main newspaper that they would be hiring 60 people and they opened a massive recruitment process. 900 people applied. We had loads of tests, group dynamics. We had to go there for two weeks on a training course because they had some proprietary technology. So you had to go through a training course and then have a test. And then they would select just a few people. And each uh, stage, they were cutting people. Uh, I had to resign from my own job as I progressed because of the, the training course to go there. So it was a big thing. They didn't hire 60. They hired 36, I think. Uh, guess what? I was hired. It was awesome, awesome. So then I was there. I was assigned to one of the business teams. And the way that was structured, they had a core team doing all the, the, the hardcore stuff and a lot of uh, business teams. So the, the client for the core team was the business teams. I was in one of the business teams. For the first three months, I kept hearing about this great core team, but most importantly, the the guy, the, the manager there, that was a phenomenal developer. Everyone was talking about that as he was like God. And, and he was working directly to the vice president, like th their room was just next to the vice president. So it's just like, the, and I said, well, I'm awesome, right? I need to be that team, I need to be in there. So three months later, uh, I, fa I saw this guy in the coffee shop, oh, in the, the coffee area, and so I, w I said, <gasps> So I just said, hi, I'm Sandro. And I said, yeah, all right. I said, uh, I didn't know what to say. So I want to work for you. So, all right. And then we spent like 30 minutes. Uh, he was asking me stuff like, what do you do outside working hours? Like, do you have any pet projects? Uh, are you playing with anything? Like, how much do you like coding? You don't ask me a single question of like Delphi that we were doing back then, or so. And then, yeah, we're talking about software. So, oh, how did you get into software? So, oh, my dad and blah blah. So, what type of stuff you did at home? So, oh, I had these projects to control players of NBA, the whole basketball thing that I'm very, uh, yeah, crazy about it. So, uh, and then so, 30 minutes later, I said, right, you can work for me. So what? Yeah. Work for me. Then a few weeks later, there was some paperwork to be done, and then I was transferred to, to that department. On a Monday morning, very early, he arrived at my desk and said, okay, I'm going to assign you some stuff. And, and yeah, and then so he explained to me what I had to do, show me, around, show me the system around, and I said, oh, cool, great. Um, and then he left, and then I said, oh, how long do I have to finish that? So how much time do I have? And said, so, well, today's Monday morning. Friday probably is okay. That was my chance, my chance to shine, right? And I was like, blah, 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 on the keyboard until midnight. Tuesday morning, I was there like 7 o'clock in the morning, blah, 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 writing code like crazy. 2 o'clock in the afternoon on Tuesday, and that was early, uh, way back in the 90s, I just r rushed into his uh, office and said, boss, I'm finished. It's finished, it's done, and by the way, it's working. And then he looked at me. And he was coding, so, well, you said that you finished, you are paid to do that, so I assume that it's working if you said it's finished. So, yeah, it makes sense. <laughs> so that was the first slap in my face. Uh, but I said, well, but the guy's God, you know, like, it's just not a bad day, potentially. Uh, and then he said, well, okay, let's see what you've done, and then I sat down with him. We were using Delphi. I don't know if you used Delphi before, but it was similar to Visual Basic back in the 90s. It had a nice IDE and no drag and drop components. All, but Delphi, the, the Delphi IDE was way ahead of its time. It was great. He opened the dot .paz in VI. I had never seen VI in my life. <laughs> I was like, what is he doing? Right? So I had written, I don't know, maybe 200 lines of code. So he started like, can you see this? If you think a little bit, there is another API that does that. You could reduce that to, like, from eight lines to two. Did you know about that? No. Uh, 
Uh, oh, this try catch here. Do you know how heap and stack works? Do you know how expensive this thing is in memory? No? So yeah, you can reduce that like this, blah, blah, blah. Here you are locating memory. You are delocating memory here. This is a potential candidate for a memory leak. All right. Um, and, and then they said, like, what is this? And then I was like, because back in the 90s, I don't know if you started in the 90s, but back in the 90s, uh, a sign of seniority is if you could write code that no one understands. <laughs> right? Yeah, the most cryptic the code is, the more senior you are, because no one understands, wow, this guy must be amazing, because I don't understand. Right? That, that's how it was. And I made sure that I could write loads of this shit. Right? So he was looking at it, and then after some time, I think that he finally understood, and then he said, like, do you know how disrespectful this is? Do you know how much? Imagine you. You're just you just joined our team. Imagine if our code base was written like that. How much will you, you would you suffer? Trying to work with a code base that you have no context, that has been, is being written over the years. Some of the original developers left, and you find this. Do you know how disrespectful it is? <laughs> In my another slap in my face. And, and then he went, well, long story short, he went through 200 lines, he destroyed it. And then, and then he turned to me and said, like, did you understand what I said? Yeah. And then he said, if you had to do it again, would you know how to do it? Sir? Yeah. And he deleted the code. <laughs> deleted. And then he turned to me and said, now do it again. You have until Friday. <laughs> I wanted to kill the bastard. I, I was leaving. Like, I, I, just, like, I, I didn't even look at him. I just stood up and then walked to the door. And then he called me. I said, Sandra. And then he said this. How it's done is as important as having it done. And then he turned it back and started typing again. Back then, I was too arrogant to understand the power of these words. So I just went downstairs, had one cigarette after another, planning in all the different possible ways that I could kill him, because how dare he speak to me like that, right? And I would resign. I wouldn't want to work there anymore. But then, when I calmed down a little bit, I realized that after all these years that I was writing code on my own, it was the first time that someone took the time to teach me, to show me to, to teach me how to be proud of my own code, to be proud of what I do, to be respectful. For almost three years, I worked in that team. I worked under him. And he taught me how to be humble. He taught me that it doesn't matter how much I know, there's always much more to learn. There's always someone better than you. So he taught me how to be proud. He taught me how to care. Not just to deliver some crap and hack some stuff and deliver. No, how to care about what I deliver. He taught me how to work in a team. He taught me how to respect my clients, delivering what they want and helping them. Back then, there was no agile, no craftsmanship. But that was my first contact with the values of software craftsmanship. I know that many of you didn't have a person like that because he changed my life, not just as a professional, as a person. Many of you never had someone like this. We cannot go back in time and change that. But you can be this person to someone. You can share what you know. You can do your best to teach the next generation. You can do the best to be the best that you can be. Improve as a professional and share that. Give that to someone. This is the only way that we are going to evolve as an industry. It doesn't matter which technology we use. We are going to keep writing crap in any technology be in Java 8, be in Scala, be in F-sharp, be in whatever. We need to change that. And the only people that can change that is ourselves. But we start with our own uh, self. So thank you very much. want to kill me right now. I don't think that they want to ask any question. Hi. Uh, you keep 
keep using the word professionalism, and the yeah, most of the time I heard about this word was the negative prefix, and usually, usually as a form of reproach, it's uh, made to me. So how would you define that word then in a form that is not reproach? How what's do your I definition of it? So what's the, the definition of professionalism? Is it what you were asking? So to, uh, to transmit a hidden message beside that. I don't know if you read the word, uh, book about uh, oh, yeah, people were. They, they made the same uh, remark when unprofessionalism is usually meant as a form of reproach and with a hidden meaning and not with a specific uh, uh, said meaning of for the word. So what's your idea of it? I'm not sure if I understood the whole question, but I'll try to summarize in terms of what is professionalism and the hidden message that may have in there. I personally, we had this debate very recently on Twitter, by the way. Uh, I don't really like, although I, I use professionalism, but any person that is paid to do a job, in theory, is a professional, being a good job or a bad job. But I think that professionalism is more than that. It's like the act of being a professional, because some people are, they happen to be a professional because they offer a service and get paid for it, so by definition they are professional. But I think that when you talk about professionalism, when it comes from you, say, I want to be a professional, the meaning is very different, because that what it means for me is like, I want to do the best that I can to help the client that is paying me. So I'll do the best job, because they normally don't know, uh, like it's like us, if I hire a plumber, or a dentist, or a doctor, or a mechanic to work in my car, I don't understand these disciplines. I don't have a way to judge if they're good or bad, but I need to trust in their professionalism that they are going to do the right thing for me and it will be a good value for my money. So I, I probably didn't answer your question, but that's what I mean by professionalism. Hi. Don't you think that to be professional, you need some experience? Uh, you ask us that uh, we should be the, the guys that we guide the others. But when you are junior, or don't you think that you can't get this uh, mindset and uh, get all of this? Yeah, uh, this is a big problem. That's what I'm always saying, that uh, some of us that have more time in the industry, we should help other people. But yes, you are right. I was a junior myself at some point, but that's, that's what I was trying to say, that when I joined that company, I joined in the business teams, that they were not as good as the other ones, and probably I was the best developer in that business team. But I, everything that I've done in my career, for almost 20 years, I was always trying to be the worst in the team that I was in. So every time that I, I, I realized that I was not learning too much, uh, what I couldn't learn much from my peers anymore, it was time for me to move, even if I liked the company. So I could be the worst somewhere else. And being the worst, you have more experienced people to you, and then you can be a sponge and then get everything that they have. So, yeah, it's difficult to have the mindset. It's much easier if someone guides you. But what you can do is always realize, am I learning anything in this job anymore? Like, every time you, you go to a job, it's, your, it's an investment that you're making as well in terms of time uh, and even passion and, and knowledge. But you need a, some sort of a return as well. And whenever this return diminish in terms of I'm not learning anymore, I already got the ex exposure that I needed to whatever, it's time to move on. So you can try to do that. But that's what I advise juniors to do. Like, don't stay for 10 years unless that you are really learning through the 10 years. But normally what happens in large organizations, you join. 10 years later, you don't have 10 years of experience. You have 10 times one year of experience because you learn some stuff in the first year. And then you spend nine years doing exactly the same thing. So I would recommend that if that's the case, just find jobs where you can learn. That's what I can, can tell you. That, that worked for me. Yeah. All right, thank you.